Uh, these are my disclosures and none of them have anything to do with the discussion that we're going to have uh, in the next hour. So my objectives today are really to help you understand and define what normally happens in the lower urinary tract, what nervous system pathways are involved in modulating this function, what happens in autonomic disorders to the urinary tract, what we do in urology with regards to diagnosis of these types of issues, and describe the treatments that you may be offered or undergo and allow you to ask lots of questions about how this happens. So the bladder does several things, and we can break it down, and, and some of the leaders in our field break it down into very straightforward terms. It has to store urine, and it has to empty the urine. And what's the role of the nervous system in doing that? And what's the role of the anatomy? So just as a general overview, and this may seem um, rudimentary to some uh, in the audience, but in general, just to get everyone on the same page, the kidneys that are up here in the back filter all the blood, and they make urine. They drop it down in, from the ureters, these tubes that run into the back, directly into the bladder. And then the urethra, this is a side view. Here you've got the urethra and the bladder, the uterus, the vagina, and the rectum. So the urethra passes the urine. And the sphincter is a circular muscle that surrounds the channel that basically holds the urine in place. All these things have to work in concert. So in order for the bladder to work effectively, it has to accommodate the urinary volume it has to keep that sphincter closed to maintain continence. It has to maintain low pressures so the urine doesn't shoot back up into the kidneys or shoot out the urethra. And this really is designed to protect your kidneys, which are some of the most valuable organs. Maybe all men don't think that, but they are to the rest of us. Um, and it has to provide appropriate sensations while it does all these tasks. Urination is really a coordinated event that should be under voluntary control. And it requires a sustained contraction of appropriate duration of the bladder, which is a muscle, and of appropriate strength to allow urine to expel. So normal bladder function includes storage, which happens as low pressure, there's no abnormal contractions, and the sphincter mechanism stays closed, so there's no leakage. Emptying requires bladder contraction and then an opening of the sphincter. This all sounds really relatively straightforward, but getting that accomplished is another feat altogether. And what I hope to express upon you is a little bit about this whole neurophysiology of how this happens so you can better understand when it doesn't go right, what may be happening in you or one of your loved ones. So it requires, and I've got this, I've got this set up in several different ways because I find some people are learners from text, some reading, some people are visual learners. So we're going to go through it in several different ways. I'm not trying to be repetitive as if you're not capturing what I'm saying. I do the same thing for all my residents and when I give lectures on this nationally is that I want everyone to get it in a different context because it's very complicated. And many urologists, even urologists that specialize in neurourology, um, don't have a good understanding of all this. But it requires a sacral reflex arc. It requires a sympathetic system to be intact in the thoracolumbar region. It requires deep brain stimulation in the pontine uh, micturition center. And this is where the inhibitory input comes in. And this is all coordinated with that bladder squeezing and the urethra relaxing. So any injury in any one of those systems can result in disorderly storage and voiding. So when we look at this and break it down a little bit further, let's just look at the sympathetic system. We, um, this comes from the lumbar cord, what leads into the bladder, and goes through a nerve called the hypogastric nerve. It's mediated by a substance called norepinephrine in the sympathetic nervous system. This comes into play later when we talk about ways that we treat bladder dysfunctions. So what norepinephrine does is it, it makes the bladder relax. 
We, it's counterintuitive to what we all think. We all think norepinephrine or adrenaline is the common term for it, excites everything. Well, it doesn't, it relaxes the bladder and it excites the sphincter. So it keeps the urine in, but it relaxes the bladder. So in order to store urine, you have to have an intact sympathetic nervous system. Now, in order to empty urine, you also have to have an intact parasympathetic system. So this comes from the sacral cord and goes through a nerve called the pelvic nerve and it uses acetylcholine. So what this one does is when it gets stimulated, so feel like you need to avoid, the, the bladder contracts and the sphincter relaxes. And that's all under your volitional control, which is the third part of the nervous system, the somatic nervous system that comes in. And this goes through a nerve called the pudendal nerve that allows you to actually <laughs> relax the external urethral sphincter. So this is another way to look at this. This is storage. So during storage, the sympathetic nervous system is activated and it relaxes the bladder. It's just hanging out and contracts the sphincter. And this is all regulated to a degree all the way from the deep brain. And in fact, there's several different regions of the deep brain that are involved in this. It's not just that one, for the longest time, everyone thought it was just this pontine micturition center that's involved. But in fact, there's multiple regions that are active during the bladder filling phase. And then when the need to void comes, the parasympathetic system turns on. So the sympathetic system's deactivated, the parasympathetic system turns on, squeezes the bladder, and inhibits the urethra. So again, normal voiding function, parasympathetic contributes to emptying, and the sympathetic contributes to storage. <coughs> so the somatic system kind of mimics these, and when the parasympathetic system is activated, it relaxes the sphincter, and when it, the sympathetic system or the storage symptom is activated, it contracts the sphincter. So again, it all has to work together. That can get a little complex. Because the bladder has to do several different things by its intrinsic nature. It's, it's a muscle, but it's not just a muscle. It has lots of different um, other types of tissues that are within it, collagen fibers, an entire matrix, and extracellular matrix. It has to stretch, and it has to fill without increasing pressure. Many neurologic injuries can change how the bladder does that. And it can't really change the pressure that's inside it as the volume increases, or this puts the kidneys at risk or puts you at risk for leakage. It has to have an adequate capacity, so you don't have to go urinate every 20 minutes. And it has to, of course, have this neural control. So what happens when you feel the need to void is that there's been a strong stretch receptor signal bladder sitting in the pelvis, it stretches, it sends these receptor signals out, the brain centers interpret this as a need to avoid, and then this signal gets conducted to all the aforementioned sy systems. The bladder contracts, the sphincter relaxes, and you pee. How does that happen? Well, this is a whole nother system. Right? You have to have all these sensory inputs that are also accurate and working so that you have to have sensory inputs that allow the bladder stretch to be noted and sensory inputs that allow that the sphincter is actually contracting. And some of these mimic the, the ones that we've already discussed, but it is a whole different nerve pathway that can be implemented. So what happens when it doesn't go directly right? I think we all remember um, or know what it's like to have relatively normal bladder function, but there's lots of different conditions um, that provoke abnormal bladder dysfunction. Um, and dysautonomia is one of them. And when I talk about this, we have tremendous amounts of data and literature on most every situation here and the impact that it has on patients and the, the neurophysiology of what's happening and voiding with one exception. And of course that one exception is POTS. Right? This has been, uh, well, of course, right? Uh, of the, when, when I 
in my practice, you know, looking at this patient population, you can imagine this is you know, a lot of the patients that I end up seeing. Um, in urology, certainly, and, and I think it, it mimics in, in life as well, because there's a lot of neurogenic bladder patients who have spina bifida and other things. It's a very marginalized population, right? And this is like the, the most marginalized and marginalized to a point where there's, there's absolutely no data out there. So when I talk to you about some of the things is generalized, I can tell you about some of the information that we've tried together, um, but overall there are mimics in each one of these that I think you can identify with and the overall overarching themes. Uh, this is a review article uh, that we put out last year about all the different classifications of autonomic disorders that may affect the lower urinary tract and certainly um, included in here in the functional disorders um, pots. But aging is additionally part of this. And then all the central nervous system disorders, spinal cord disorders, and peripheral nervous system disorders of which POTS has features of A, B, C, and D. But what this ends up being is that these urinary symptoms that can become most bothersome to people include leakage. It includes symptoms of urinary urgency and frequency, but it also includes leakage. And there's several different types that one can encounter. One being urgency, which is really an overwhelming need to urinate. Even if you just want, you know, you just cannot defer this, this need. There's stress urinary incontinence, which is more common, say, in women after childbirth or men after radical pelvic surgery, but can happen anytime there's a deficit in that sphincter muscle. So any increase in intra-abdominal pressure, coughing, sneezing, lifting will cause leakage. And then mixed, which is really a combination of both of these. And this type of incontinence that people encounter really changes with aging. In the general population, most younger patients, especially ones who've had children, have more stress incontinence, and this changes in aging patients to be predominantly mixed and urge, because all those different things that accompany even normal aging can cause autonomic disorders uh, that are not so labeled, but we take as an appropriate or a natural response to aging. But it's exceptionally common no matter what group you're in. So this is something that, that patients encounter in every spectrum. It's more common than hypertension, depression, and diabetes in the, in the community. Very common problem. But we don't see it as much because it's an isolating problem. It has amazing impacts on patients' quality of life. I have lots of patients who cannot go to their normal activities because they either have overwhelming urgency and have to be near bathrooms, or they leak and will not go to church or go anywhere for that matter because of that fear. So it can cause social isolation and depression, distress, um, of course, skin inflammation and breakdown if there's high volume leakage, urinary infections. Uh, sleep disturbance, not even to mention the issues that it can have, especially in younger patients with regards to sexual activity. And the costs are staggering, over $20 billion a year. I and mean, you go, go to Kroger, something, you know, and the, that aisle there that was supposed to be baby diapers is not. It's all adult diapers now. I go down there sometimes and just put my card in between the... <laughs> yeah. I don't, but I should. Like I said. But people, people will come in and they're spending their life savings on pads and diapers. Right? Spending their life savings or spending all their available income on these types of products, thinking this is all I've got. And I only see a tip of the iceberg of patients that need help. So, of course, the more severe it is, the higher the costs are to the patients. This is a gross underestimate, it's several years old, and Kimberly Clark is minting money off of this. They're minting money. So what are our general expectations when we look at different types of neurologic dysfunctions, autonomic dysfunctions that may impact the bladder? So if there's a brain lesion, the bladder may not store urine very well and may be overactive. 
you may, you're likely to have that sphincter work appropriately and you're likely to maintain some sensation of bladder filling. When you get down and start having spinal cord lesions, it's variable, uh, but sometimes you can have the bladder functioning with the sphincter closed, which is very dangerous for the kidneys, and inability to empty. And then peripheral lesions may have loss of sensation and loss of motor function. And when we kind of group disorders and look at what some of the manifestations may be, in MS we see a lot of bladder overactivity, but we also see this thing called dyssynergia, which is basically where the sphincter is closed and the bladder is contracting. In Parkinson's, much bladder overactivity, um, strokes bladder overactivity, in MSA, bladder overactivity, because there's not um, any sympathetic innervation to the bladder neck, so you have a closed sphincter as well during bladder contractions, which is a very distressing and dangerous situation. And what's interesting in many cases is that these bladder symptoms will often precede the eventual diagnosis of one of these types of neurologic or autonomic dysfunctions. And the things that are most common that we have patients come in and see, that we have to have a high index of suspicion, is there something else going on here when a young patient comes in and has urgency, frequency, incontinence, and retention. So knee-jerk reaction for a lot of people is to go to a neurologist, right? Who, who in the room's been to a neurologist? Everybody, right? <laughs> who diagnosed their POTS in the, in the neurology department? Like nobody, right? So that's where everybody at some point got diagnosed with something else. And that's part of the issue is that this is a, a learning process because we don't have data for everyone that most patients, young patients who come in with this set of symptoms end up being called dysfunctional voiders. Um, so it's a problem that you had since you were a kid. Oh, well, it's a problem you had as a kid. And so you just never learned to use the bathroom, right? Or you've got some emerging neurologic condition that nobody's diagnosed. And those are really the two mainstays. So the rest of it is a gray area that's not appreciated by most all of your urology. So urinary urgency and sometimes urge leakage is generally referred to as overactive bladder. So these symptoms of urgency and frequency, sometimes associated with nocturia, which is getting up a lot at night to urinate, uh, is overactive bladder. And urgency really is the hallmark symptom of this condition. And this is, again, the sudden compelling desire to go. You just can't defer it. And it's due, in most parts, to an involuntary contraction. So you're actually having a contraction of the bladder, muscle spasm, like you'd have a charley horse in your calf going on when you get this urgency symptom. So what do you do if you start having these symptoms and come to us? Well, most of the time, if you go to a urologist and you're starting to have these problems, they should be doing the following things. I can't guarantee that they all will, but this is what they should be doing. They should be doing a history and physical, getting your whole set of symptoms. They should be looking at the urine to rule out other causes. Maybe it's just a urinary tract infection, another very common thing. <coughs> should also maybe consider to make sure that everybody's emptying well. So that's what a post-void residual is. It's a little bladder scanner that goes over and looks at how much you have left in your bladder after urination. Sometimes using a diary to see what oh my, your fluid intake is, may be important. And symptom questionnaires are also an important tool. In complex situations, which I would gather to say, if anyone in this room ends up in a urology office um, with a, another diagnosis like POTS or any type of, of dysautonomia, you're gonna end up going down that complex pathway to rule out other things. You're gonna undergo tests called urodynamics, cystoscopy, and every once in a while, like CT scans. So I wanted to go over what some of those are as well. But I wanted to talk to you about the, what little we know about symptom severity and POTS. Because before this paper, no one had ever correlated, do women with POTS actually have symptoms that mimic overactive bladder? 
So we looked with Dr. Raj at 32 women who'd come in to our uh, clinical research center for autonomic evaluation. And it was a young group, 33. <laughs> that's a really young to me now. Like, that's good. <laughs> that's like getting younger every day. Um, average age of 33, but 32 women who had POTS diagnosis. And we just asked the question, you know, we, Bonnie Black, who had worked there for a long time, had actually approached me and said, Melissa she said, I've got all these women who are just complaining about all these symptoms of, you know, that sound like overactive bladder, what's going on? So we just asked, we asked the questions, well, you know, are you having these problems? Are you having urgency? Are you leaking? Are you having nighttime urination? And it turns out that almost 70% of these patients, these young patients, met clinical diagnosis for overactive bladder symptoms. And you think, well, okay, the worst problem, obviously, urinary frequency. Because we all know if, if you drink a lot of water, you got to go pee a lot. I mean, that's, that's a pretty simple correlation. I don't need to counsel people with POTS about that. Most people are pretty aware. But that wasn't the bothersome part. The bothersome parts were things that don't associate with drinking a lot of water. The bothersome parts were things like having to get up at night all the time, which may not be associated with water input at all, but more related to the autonomic dysfunction and the um, posture, which is another interesting thing. But we're, we're beginning to look at these things, but this is really the extent of the data that's out there to this point. So what happens when you come to the clinic and say, hey, I'm having all these bladder problems, is there anything we can do um, because I can't reduce my fluid intake, right? One of the things, because there may be other factors and because we don't exactly know that this is not some other neurologic diagnosis because we want to make sure that there's not risk to the kidneys or something else happening is that you undergo this test called the urodynamics. So you walk into this room and it looks really intimidating, right? That's like, that's crazy talk, like that's spooky. And I think it's weird and everybody thinks it's weird. Um, but we try to make you as comfortable as possible and just knowing that this is gonna give you very valuable information. So I have a colleague who actually did a study on patients before and after urodynamics and, and they're, it's a, a very scary test to think about having, but once people did it, they realized that it wasn't as big a deal as what they had kind of you know, made it out to be. So I find sometimes explaining less and just going through the process can help. But since you're here today, you get to hear all about it. <laughs> so this is the chair where everyone sits and, and has a little catheters placed. And this is a C arm. So this is gonna allow us to look with a video perspective. So we put contrast in the bladder and still contrast and allows us to see the shape of the bladder, sometimes the sphincter mechanism. It allows us to see whether urine's going back up into the kidneys, which is a really dangerous situation. And then you're hooked up as well to these pressure monitors here. So in, a, in another perspective, we take water or contrast and that goes through a catheter into the bladder. These are tiny little pediatric catheters. So I see all the guys in the audience like super squirming, right? Because <laughs> if you're a guy and you have a prostate, you're definitely getting this too. Because you, you have a whole nother complicated part of the system. Um, but they're tiny little pediatric catheters. But in addition to having this catheter go in to instill fluid, it has a channel that allows us to look at pressure within the bladder. So this tells us everything we need to know about how that bladder's storing urine and how it's going to empty the urine. We have another pressure catheter that can go either in the vagina or the rectum, and this also measures pressure. And you can think about this is that the bladder, in those first anatomy pictures, the bladder sitting underneath all the bowels. So part of it's exposed to your abdominal cavity. So when you bear down, you're putting pressure on the bladder. So we have to do a little bit of calculation to determine exactly what's happening in the bladder and what component of that is just abdominal pressure. And that's why this is a second catheter. And then we're looking at the amount of flow that comes out. And we look at some 
well, EMG pads, which are basically small pads that go on the pelvic floor muscles that measure pelvic floor muscle activity. And this is very important for us to try to determine what's happening like during voiding are all the pelvic floor muscles or the sphincter closing. We'll probably also do a test to rule out other things that could be going on like stones or even gross within the bladder or some abnormality of anatomy that you just weren't, didn't recognize it existed. And it's called cystoscopy. So it's a little flexible light scope that's about the size of a regular catheter if you've ever seen a catheter. And we just kind of fish this in with a lot of lubricant lots and lots of lubricant, and take a look at the lining of the bladder and the urethra, and this is what normal bladder lining looks like. So what do we see? What do we normally see when we do patients with autonomic dysfunction, neurologic injury? A lot of the times we see what we call neurogenic overactivity. So these are bladder contractions that are due to relevant neurologic conditions, and they're involuntary and they can be spontaneous. Sometimes we can provoke them, but mostly they're spontaneous. And it's a loss of inhibition of that storage mechanism of the bladder. And they're often associated in sensate patients with urgency, frequency, and sometimes with leakage. And this is an actual urodynamics tracing. And you may see these floating around, or if you're in the urologist clinic, you may see these going on up there. So I just thought I'd explain it to you because it's, it's relatively straightforward. It looks really mysterious. So did all those pictures that that anesthesia neurosurgeon guy was showing before too. Like even to me, those look mysterious. But this one, it's really not. It's a pressure tracing. So this is the catheter that's in the bladder and it should stay nice and flat. This is the catheter that's in the abdomen, so in the, the vagina or the rectum. In order to determine what's the pressure in the bladder, we just subtract this from this and we end up with this third line. So this is actually just the pressure in the bladder. These are the pads that are on the pelvic floor. This is the amount of flow that's coming out. So when you urinate or leak, that's what comes out. This is the volume that comes out with this flow, and this is what we put in. So you can see easily that we're just putting in fluid here, and it's increasing, and it goes in at a certain rate, which is not anything close to what you're used to with your kidneys. So what should happen is that this should just stay flat until I say, okay, time for you to go. Go ahead, time for you to pee. And then you mount a contraction volitionally and cause an increase in pressure that is associated with flow. But here what happens instead is you're just sitting there going along and then all of a sudden you're like, I gotta go. Like, I'm going even though I don't know I'm going, I gotta go. And that's this contraction. So the bladder's contracting without the patient wanting it to contract. And in this situation, actually causing some leakage out. So this is neurogenic, we call it detrusor because that's the bladder muscle detrusor, but neurogenic overactivity. The other bad problem that can occur is that the bladder can fail to store urine correctly because it loses appropriate nerve signals that then cause the bladder itself to not stretch appropriately. So it basically gains scar tissue inside the bladder. This can cause kidney damage in the long term as well as leakage. So this is a picture of how that happens. We start to fill the bladder here. And then you see the bladder pressures just gradually rise, 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 rise. And I've put an arrow here because that's an important point. We don't want these bladder pressures to rise too high because what happens then is that the bladder will go, or the urine will go back up into the kidneys. So this is an x-ray during one of these tests. This is the bladder, this is the urethra. And what we see is that the urine's shooting back up into those kidneys because of the high pressure in the bladder. In this patient, it's also causing a leak out. And you can see here the internal system, the collecting system of the kidney is very distended and the ureter or the drainage tube of the kidney is a little tortuous because of this distension and they have reflux on, on both sides. And here's another picture of some what we call reflux and this is from poor compliance in this bladder. And then occasionally if we're putting contrast in, we can also see, and as we talked about before, sometimes the bladder can squeeze and the sphincter squeezes at the same time. And that's uncoordinated. So here we've got the bladder, 
and here's the urine channel, the urethra, and you can see while this patient is urinating, they're closing off the muscle at the same time. This is most common in higher spinal cord injuries and very, very uncommon in conditions of dysautonomia. But what some of these things do is put patients at risk for renal damage. So say spina bifida patients, if they store urine at these very high pressures for prolonged periods of time, then it'll dilate these kidneys and eventually cause renal failure. Again, this is very common outside of high spinal cord injuries uh, and, and very uncommon in dysautonomias. So what do we do? So let's say we find overactivity or you have urgency and frequency and maybe even some incontinence leakage. Well, what, are your, what are your options for treatment of these conditions? So we have behavioral therapies, medications, and the medications, the reason you're gonna understand what they're doing more than 99.9% .9 of people is because now you understand what the bladder has to do to store an empty urine. Most of the time we do combined therapies then there's some minimally invasive treatments, and at the very end is surgery. So obviously our first line therapies is to try to pre treat the primary condition, right? If we have a way to reverse whatever's happened that is causing the bladder dysfunction, then it may alleviate a lot of the symptoms. There's certainly treatment of some connective tissue disorders and autoimmune disorders can result in improvement in bladder symptoms. In MS, it waxes and wanes dramatically depending on the level of um, treatment of the MS. And then we embark on behavioral therapies. So bladder training, understanding when you get the urge, what kind of positions you can get into, what kind of techniques you can utilize to try to defer that urge. Um, some pelvic floor muscle training can often be helpful too. Fluid management, I and mean, this is really difficult, right? When you've, got to, <laughs> when you've got to drink a lot of fluid, if you're drinking two and a half, three liters of water a day, this is the same for our kidney stone patients. That we mandate that our kidney stone patients drink up to, to three liters of water a day for stone prevention. It's very difficult to alleviate urinary frequency during the day by utilizing this. Sometimes weight loss can also help. It decreases metabolic um, syndrome, decreases metabolic load and irritation of the bladder. And of course, we're counseling the patients tailored specifically to their symptoms and setting expectations and realistic goals. I mean, if you like spicy foods or you drink alcohol or you drink a bunch of coffee and caffeine, then you need to know that when that happens, when you do those behaviors, your bladder's gonna respond to it. It's a storage organ and it's storing everything that gets filtered through the bloodstream which is why it's such a toxic environment for things like tobacco smoke. Big number one thing that we see with regards to uh, bladder cancer and kidney cancer is tobacco use because it's a storage, right? it's filtering everything and then just storing it in there, all those toxins. And the same thing happens, unfortunately, with like Taco Bell, you know? <laughs> it's not, I didn't say Taco Bell was toxic, I love it too, right? But all those spicy foods end up somewhere and they end up sitting in your bladder and causing increasing irritation. So if you're already primed. So the targets for therapy that we have with regards to treatments, pharmacologic treatments, are the same things you already know about that we just discussed. There are targets that are in the parasympathetic system and targets in the sympathetic system that directly innervate the bladder. So these are commonly referred to in most cases as anticholinergic therapy. Everybody's heard of these. They, they're all on TV. They're the pipe people on TV. Got to go, got to go, got to go right now, people. Um, and you've probably seen or heard of many of these different types of medicines. And there's a second one now that's on the market. So all these work by inhibiting the abnormal contractions, which means they can also inhibit the normal contractions. There's a new player on the block, which actually al um, allows the bladder to hold urine more passively because it's stimulating that storage symptom. One of the bad, and we'll talk about that in a second, but one of the worst problems that patients have with anticholinergics is dry mouth, dry eyes, and constipation. And this is why most patients will actually, about 90% by one year, stop these medications, even if they're getting some clinical efficacy, 
because all these different types of side effects are extraordinarily bothersome. This other agent actually relaxes the bladder during storage. So it's stimulating, as we know, the norepinephrine system, the sympathetic system, and relaxing the bladder as it stores. It has a few, it has some of the same, but less of the side effects. And actually one of the side effects uh, may be uh, hypertension, which may be good in some cases. For patients who fail medications or who can't tolerate them, we have several other options. These are severe OAB patients who, who just can't, um, who are willing to undergo a maybe office-based, maybe surgical procedure. And several different types of neuromodulation. You can imagine this is a nervous system disorder, overactive bladder, and so we're using neuromodulation to treat it. And we use neuromodulation either from an electrical stimulation or from botulinum toxin. So sacral neuromodulation works by looking at those sensory nerves that feed out of the bladder and send those signals up to the spinal cord. And it detracts them from allowing that reflex arc and that overactivity to occur. So it really modulates both voiding and storage pathways. We also have one that's called percutaneous. So the first one is percutaneous tubule nerve simulation. And this is done with 30 minute sessions for 12 weeks where you get this little acupuncture needle put in the tibial nerve and it kind of transmits the signal up into the sacral nerve and around the bladder. Very uncommon to have side effects. The efficacy, and I mean, it's a lot to come in for 30 minutes once a week and do this, and then you have to come in for booster treatments as well. But for some patients who don't want to undergo any further invasive therapies, it's an excellent option to try. Sacral neuromodulation is actually an implant that goes in the sacral nerves, and it's an indicated for retention as well as urgency and frequency. And we've also gotten an indication for bowel incontinence as well. So that's a very um, debilitating condition for a lot of patients. It's an outpatient surgery, and it's not completely MRI compatible, but it can be life-changing in the appropriate patient. And then the other thing is blocking acetylcholine, the parasympathetic system that causes overactivity, and it's Botox injections to the bladder. I have a lot of patients and the nurses like, so there's a little left, can you do a little extra? And they're saying, no, no, we can't do that. But um, it is extraordinarily effective in stopping some of these overactive contractions and, and abnormal sensations in the bladder. You don't have to have general anesthesia. We can put local anesthesia, do this in the clinic, and basically go in and inject it in the back of the bladder with that little cystoscope that you saw before. There are events of urinary tract infections, and the most worrisome thing is that, again, this attacks the parasympathetic system, so it stops the bladder from squeezing completely. So you can have incomplete emptying, and even for a small time period, if I do this for you and things are gotten a lot better but you're not emptying your bladder, it's going to be upon you to have to pass a catheter a couple times a day in order to get it to empty. And although that's rare, if it does happen and it happens to you, it can be a real detractor from using the medication again. And it does have to be repeated. Botox doesn't work forever. And some patients have problems with the bladder where they have to catheterize to empty. And if that's the case, it's a relatively straightforward procedure for most patients. It removes the need for any type of indwelling catheter. And we teach patients to use very small and unobtrusive catheters and it can make emptying a lot easier in some instances. Many patients ask me, well, you know, they, they get catheters and they have to throw them away after every use, kind of filling the landfills. Does this really the way you, people want this? And sometimes that's convenient, but the fact is, is the data is not supportive of doing that. And you can reuse catheters with a lot of safety. Um, it doesn't really matter any of these things, but the catheter companies are in hoots with Kimberly Clark and they're making a ton of money off of this. And somebody thought it was a good idea at Medicare, so Medicare pays for all of it. And if things just really don't work out and we can't control symptoms, we can do more invasive surgeries like placing permanent, more permanent catheters. And in very rare instances, 
We will um, either place a bowel patch onto the bladder to stop some of these abnormal contractions or actually divert the urine and remove the bladder altogether. Very rare. So what I wanted you to leave you with is understanding a little bit about storage and voiding and how this is a very highly coordinated neuromuscular event. Sympathetic input drives storage. Parasympathetic input drives urination and voiding. That there's behavioral therapies, medication therapies, minimally invasive therapies, and surgery for treatment. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group and thank you for your attention. I know, it's just a bad joke. It's, like, it's the worst. It's really. Any questions? Yes. That's a very interesting question, and I think, um, I think that you are probably on to something. We tend to think of Fowler syndrome patients as um, almost on the neurologic spectrum, and they get grouped into that, that, is, that group of patients that we call dysfunctional voiders. So we take it as a behavioral learned type of neurologic issue, when in fact it may very well be a dysautonomia. And if you look at how it manifests and we put all that together, there's absolutely no data to suggest that. But I think that is a very insightful comment because in fact, this is a syndrome of Fowler syndrome where patients have almost what looks like that dyssynergia. So they're contracting their pelvic floor at the same time as um, actually squeezing the bladder. I do have a number of patients that have responded amazingly effectively to the sacral neuromodulation. So that's my number one treatment if I have a patient that I suspect has classic Fowler syndrome. But understanding in any of these conditions, except for maybe you have a T12 spinal cord injury, I can tell you what's going to happen. But in general, for the dysautonomias, understanding what got a patient, or even just OAB, what got a patient to those bladder symptoms is rare rare. I can treat symptoms, but I rarely get back to the causes. Yes, because I had like uh, the complete neurological evaluation, three video neurodynamics. My urethral pressure is off the chart. Mm -hmm. I have uh, the true sort of dys dysmergia, fibrillatory mm -hmm. um, contraction, and um, pelvic floor, we have did not work, uh, drug if you were in my clinic with that set of symptoms, amazing success with sacral neuromodulation, no question. I think it, it especially as you do a staged implant with sacral neuromodulation, so we put in a permanent lead first, and then you get to test it like wearing around an external battery of pager for a week to see if it works for you. So you're going to know before you get committed to that therapy that it actually works. So it's probably a great idea. My yes, daughter is 31 now. It's like hindsight is 2020. We have realized that she had sensitivity to light, sensitivity to loud noises, and she wet her bed until she was like 13 or 14 and still does every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, we had no idea that bladder function had anything to do with pipes at all. But now that we're here and we're learning all this, um, is there anything she can do about that now? So nocturnal enuresis, we're asking about, you know, bedwetting, basically, which can persist in many patients with autonomic dysfunction into adulthood. Does she get pain, too? I, yeah. I gave her cranberry juice all the time. That was exactly. Not. Well, the pain, oftentimes, and so the question also is about pain. The pain comes from the fact this is like a muscle spasm in the bladder. It's literally a Charlie horse cramp that you're having in the bladder can cause excruciating pain. What happens when patients are sleeping is that all the other symptoms, all the other uh, sensory symptoms that you would normally have that would provoke you to run to the bathroom are absent. And so that bladder squeezes and all the muscles are relaxed in the pelvic floor and it, it comes out you wet the bed. Mm 
So again, these ty same types of behavioral and, and pharmacologic therapies and, and minimally invasive therapies that we use for daytime urgency frequency work well for nocturnal enuresis. A lot of it has to do some about fluid management, making sure that you don't have a lot of fluid right before bedtime, sometimes setting an actual clock to get up in the middle of the night. If you know this happens at 2 a.m., you have to get up at 1 and empty the bladder. These types of therapies can, can help, but there's probably a lot of daytime symptoms that that just is a signal of, too. Uh, can she get referred? Yeah, I'd, I'd look for a neurourologist, somebody who has training in neurourology, and a lot of the times. Um, we live here in Nashville, that's why I was wondering. Oh yeah, well I'm at Vanderbilt. <laughs> 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 Melissa dot Kaufman at Vanderbilt dot edu. Okay. Yeah, do, do you guys have all my? Do they get all my information? Like they get these slide sets and stuff. All the slides will be available on the Design Any International. Yeah, so website. you. Yeah, you, you'll get all this information, and I'm just down at, at Vanderbilt. Great. Thank you so much. You bet. Yes, ma'am. I have a 17-year-old who has either no urge or awareness that she needs to go to the bathroom, or it is a crisis of emergency, mm -hmm. but she also very infrequently needs to go. I don't know where to take her, and she's 17, so she's like, no. Um, yeah, so, but we see... Yeah. I see a lot of transitional patients because I, I see um, all the patients who have had congenital urologic conditions as children, like spina bifida, um, cerebral palsy, those types of things. So um, 17 years old is in that that I'm not going to do anything you tell me time frame, right? Of course she is. It's very difficult. We have some great pediatric urologists who she may be comfortable at least discussing these things with, and that's might might be where you can start. Um, when she hits 18, she can always come to an adult clinic, but that's a very intimidating environment. So starting with a pediatric urologist, because a lot of them deal with many of these same issues, uh, but they look at it from a little different perspective. So you have to explain that there's this overlying condition that may be driving some of this. But the same types of treatment strategies are available in the pediatric population. And she also has dystonia, so with that... Mm -hmm. It, that would be difficult to discern. Yeah. Yes. Mass activation syndrome. So, so that's the question between that and bladder symptoms. So it's very interesting. There is a, another bladder condition that is just as uh, marginalized and misunderstood as, as POTS, and it's called interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. It is neither of the above. It is not a interstitial anything. It is likely a sensory response issue that comes from uh, a global perspective. And we have several different theoretical mechanisms of action for that. And one of them happens to be mast cell activation. So they found increased levels of mast cells in these patients. And we actually target some of the treatments like using histamine blockers for this patient population. So is this something that could be on a continuum? Absolutely. But the, so that's the bladder. These patients come in, they have an incredible array of comorbidities. They have an incredible array of symptoms that no one understands. So they get put in this bucket and say, well, you must have IC when in fact, who knows exactly what it is, but people um, don't have the knowledge or the breadth of interest to try to figure that out. And that's probably, yes, that's, it's insightful. It's probably on that continuum. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, can medications cause or make worse bladder issues? So certainly medications that would increase irritability of the urinary tract by causing increased fluid load. We see a lot of patients on, say, diuretics, uh, but there are certain medications that have metabolites that get filtered into the bladder that may increase sensitivity. And that's usually kind of a case-by-case -case basis is that a patient will begin the medication, will know it's filtered through the kidneys as a, its excretory mechanism, and then they start to have bladder symptoms. So you can check, you know, one by one if there's things that you can titrate up and down to see if it's contributing. Yes, ma'am. 
but absolutely. They also change the color of the urine, color and odor. Most of those things come from medications or food products that we eat. Rarely is it secondary to an infection. Thank you so much. I appreciate your attention.